your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love all of mankind as you would love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love all of mankind as you would love yourself. We've got Christian lives to live, we've got Jesus' love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in Him we abide. We've got Christian lives to live, we've got Jesus' love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in Him we abide. Love, we've got Lord your God with all your heart, we've got all your soul and all your mind, we've got Love and love and kind as you would love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love and love and kind as you would love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love and love and kind as you would love yourself. We've got Christian lives to live. We've got. Jesus love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in Him we abide. We've got Christian lives to live, we've got Jesus love to give, we've got nothing to hide because in Him we all Yes, I, I hear God singing to me. I, I 
Good morning, brothers and sisters and uh, friends. I hope uh, you all can hear me. If you can hear me, please give a thumbs up. And I hope that's fine. Great. Uh, once again, I would like to welcome on behalf of uh, the International Church of Christ, uh, Dubai, UAE. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, those friends who are joining for the first time as well. A warm greetings and a very good morning. And um, I'd like to encourage you this morning uh, uh, with a, a, a scripture uh, from Isaiah. And uh, before that, uh, I would like to appreciate the hearts of people, those who come here once again, uh, seeking God uh, with an honest heart. We uh, live in a fast paced world, uh, especially like in a city like Dubai or any metropolitan cities. So time is something that uh, is very indispensable and uh, we do not like waiting. We don't have our patience or we easily lose our patience in especially when it comes to time or when it comes to like meeting appointment with people or even standing in the line. Uh, and also we are even to the point where we are willing to pay to have that service quickly. Like for example, express delivery, I mean, even for food uh, or even for line, we I mean, pay extra so that it can get delivered very quickly. So that's the world that we live in right now. And uh, uh, if you look at the Bible, you know, like it, there's something that we can also see parallelly about what it says about having in hope or waiting for God. A very famous uh, verse from Isaiah 40, verse 31. Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, they will mourn up with wings like eagles. They will run, not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is what the Bible says about waiting on the God, waiting for the Lord. So patience or perseverance are the essence when it comes to our walk with God. Without this, uh, we, cannot, we cannot worship him. We cannot have a relationship with God because it's not something that we'll get. I mean, when, whenever we want, it's not something that it will go as per what we wish. So that's not how God works. And on the contrary, I mean, our, we, there's a hypocrisy also about human beings or about ourselves. Like, there are some things that interest us. We are even willing to... Richard, we cannot hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Those who hear me? Can you, no, okay, some of them, they said they can hear. Sorry. Is it fine? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. I think for some of us, unfortunately, uh, they cannot hear. Okay. Anyway, uh, like I said, we are, illing, uh, we are even willing to wait um, for some of the things that interest us. It could be even uh, um, like football mats or concerts or something that, you know, we are even willing to go out and do extra miles and uh, complete a series of uh, TV series in one night. I mean, we are even willing to invest that time. But when it comes to God, unfortunately, I mean, we can easily lose our patience or um, we cannot wait. In, for example, this morning service, it's going to be at least one hour or one and a half hour. So I hope uh, we come all uh, 
earnestly uh, to listen to the sermon of the day. And um, like I said, uh, we become, we, we like to do things uh, like we like, even like we can easily um, microwave certain things and have it instead of like in the whole process. I mean, that's, there's a term called microwave Christians. So I would encourage, not, let's not become like that. Unfortunately, the world has been becoming like that. Even in the church as well, you know, we can even cut down timing. We don't know what can happen after 10 years from now uh, to us as well. But when it comes to our walk with God, it involves perseverance and patience. Through that, we'll receive his power and strength. That's what the scripture inspires us. And uh, this morning, the lineup is we have our, for communion, our brother Dennis who will preach us. And for sermon, we have uh, our brother Freddie Miranda from Hong Kong Church, who's gonna share the word of God with us this morning. And at the closing, our brother Chris will uh, close this sermon, uh, this service. So before we proceed uh, to this worship service, let's give it to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful morning, Father God, where we all come, Father God, to worship you, Father God. Thank you for the health. Thank you for the night that was, Father God, and thank you for taking care of us in this time of uncertainty, Father God, where we can fall sick or succumb to pandemic anytime, Father God. We are under your protection and your grace, Father God. Thank you so much for your blessings every morning, Father God, and for inspiring us with your word and uh, for Jesus Christ, your son, Father God, who died for us, Father God. Even as we, Father God, uh, look forward to have this amazing um, day, Father God. Inspire our hearts, Father, touch our hearts so that we can um, listen to it, grasp your word, Father God, and Father God. We can practice it every day, Father God, and put it in our hearts and mind, Father. I submit for uh, the rest of the day, the, the service, those who are going to preach, those who are going to uh, take part in it, Father God, may you touch their heart, speak through their mouth, their tongue, Father God, and we can have a very amazing, fruitful day, Father. I pray for this morning. I submit in your mighty Jesus' name. Amen. It's all 
Good morning, everybody. Good foggy morning. I hope everybody's doing well, and I'm really excited today uh, to worship with you. Um, open your Bible with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Okay, so I hope you are all there. I'm going to read. It says here, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jews are very special people. Let me recount some of them here for you. They received adoption to sonship. They received and experienced divine glory. They received the covenant. They have the law. And thanks to them, because what we have existing today, we inherit from the Jews. We would not know stealing or murder or dishonoring parents as seen if not because of their law. They were given the temple worship. They received the promised. Patriarchs came from them. And Christ's human ancestry was traced from them. What is cool here is that God came down in human form and chose to become Jews himself. In Matthew, a Canaanite woman was asking for help from Jesus. And Jesus said that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So you can just imagine that Jesus actually came down to this world to seek for the lost sheep of Israel. He said that it was not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Therefore, if we are not Jews, then we are Gentiles. In the passage that we just read, Paul was highlighting that as Gentiles, we are called uncircumcised. We were separated and do not have part in Christ. We were excluded from citizenship in Israel. We were aliens to the covenants of the promise. We were without hope. We were godless. The stark comparison between the Jews and the Gentiles can be depressing to the poor. Paul is telling us, therefore, to remember who we were. We were uncircum uncircumcised Gentiles. We all know that circumcision is a covenant Jews received from God through Abraham, which they practiced thoroughly and diligently, and by doing so religiously would make them part of God's people, and they are very proud of it. Remember when Goliath was spewing blasphemous runs to the Israel, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, after summarizing the Old Testament, said to the crowd of Jews, you steep-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. The Jews could not accept Stephen despoiling their connection within the family of God. Therefore, Jews did not hesitate in stoning him to death. We can make out that Paul's statement of uncircumcised Gentiles here is a derision, and we ought to understand its seriousness. Before we became a disciple, we were foolish. We are disobedient. We are deceived and enslaved by all kinds of worldly passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. I did not know the life of the Spirit. I only walked in obedience to the flesh. I wandered aimlessly in complete darkness in the valley of the shadow of death. What hope did I have? Paul continued by saying that we were excluded from the citizenship and are foreigners to the covenant of the promise. No hope and without God. Life can be meaningless and unfulfilling if that is the case. No future, nothing but life that lies within the boundary of this world until they go back to the ground and cycle of the world begins anew, on and on it goes. However, fortunately, this cycle was broken when Jesus came. Our hopelessness was washed away by the blood of Jesus. His cross, his death, his resurrection had given us an, a new opportunity, a new hope to live a fulfilling, purpose-driven life and became a naturalized citizen of God's family. We became alive with Jesus and with the glorious eternal future of the revelation of God's kindness in heaven. But since our nature is forgetful, we need to be placed in a constant reminder. The book of Hebrews warned us to pay more careful attention to what we have heard, so we do not drift away. 
Paul said that if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare us either. Let us not forget that we were branded as uncircumcised Gentiles who were given the chance to become part of God's family through Jesus. Do not take it lightly and not to take it for granted. So no matter what you are doing, no matter who you are, no matter what situation you are in, if you are in Christ, you are part of the family. You are special in God's eyes. Do not allow anyone to take that away from you. Do not listen to the whispers and temporary attractions of the glittering world, which will slowly drift you away from the faith. We did not draw near to God, but through the agonizing sacrifice and death, which Jesus obediently endured on the cross, brought us near him. As we take the bread and the wine, let us be reminded about our depressing state before he brought you and me near to God. It is not the circumcision of the flesh that makes us part of God's family, but Jesus' death, which should encourage us to strive all the more in this continuous circumcision of our hearts. The worldly thoughts and the attitude of our hearts must continually be snipped off until our heart of stone is replaced by the heart of flesh, until our worldly satisfaction and happiness do not matter anymore compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of this, but one thing we should all do, remember then who we were before we became a disciple of Christ. Remember now and onwards our God who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, because in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. And also to remember to look forward to the future that awaits us all beyond the azure blue, which he set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Let us forget what is behind, which is our worldly ways of life that hinders us from becoming the man and woman that he intends us to be, but instead keeps training toward what is ahead. Let's press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much again for uh, this morning. Thank you so much for extending to us your grace, allowing us, God, to become part of your family. God, it's really depressing to know that we are nothing but Gentiles, that we have been given the chance because, God, we don't know what's going to happen to us if it wasn't because of you. Thank you for the hope that was brought to us by the blood of Jesus. Thank you so much, God, for today. God allows us to remember that we are nothing without you. We cannot do anything without you. Allow us get to commune with you all the more, all the days of our lives, until we are called heavenwards. God, we cannot thank you enough for everything. God, with all the protections that you keep on providing us, apart from all the things that you promised to us, God, what else can we ask from, from you? We just need to be rejoicing. Just like what Paul said, rejoice all the more, always. God, allow us God, to have that continuously streaming from our, our hearts, that joy, that peace mm -hmm. because of you. We want to lift up everything to you today, our sins and all the things that we have done that is displeasing, displeasing to you, God. I pray God, that as well, that as we partake on this, uh, this uh, bread and the wine, I pray that you bless them. I pray that you allow us God, to remember that we need to be reminded of how we were before you came to reach out to us. We want to lift up everything to you, even those people who are sick in the hospital now. Please heal them. Please take your proverb and even the family and even Sarah and Doris, God, and all those people who are affected by this COVID. I pray for those people who are um, got in depressing situation at the moment, who are depressed, who are abused, who are exploited. I pray for all of them. And I pray that as a result of all these challenges that, that all of us are facing, I pray that at the end of the time, we will see always the light. God, we want to say thank you for everything. Thank you for your love. Please bless this fellowship and all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God. Why are you doing this to me? Do you hear me? Any kindness you take away. You were the one who gave me the dreams. You brought me the gift. Some gift. My dreams are lies. What have I done to deserve this? right I thought I had the answers I thought I chose the surest road but that road brought me so I put up a fight and told you how to help me now just when I have given up the truth is coming clear you than I You know the way I've let go the need to know why For you know better than I If this has been a test I cannot see the reason But maybe knowing I don't know Is part of getting through I tried, tried to, to do what's best And faith has made it easy To see the best thing I can do Is put my trust in you For you know Better than I You know the way I've let go The need to know why For you know better than I I saw one cloud and thought it was the sky I saw a bird and thought that I could follow But it was you who taught that bird to fly If I let you reach me Will you teach me? For you know better than I you Supply You know better than I Good morning church Thank you Dennis for uh, taking us to the cross and uh, right now it's time for us to listen to uh, a special brother He's coming in all the way from Hong Kong. Um, he's leading the co-leading the international ministry with his wife. And interestingly, more than 50% of that ministry are Filipino sisters who work very hard to take care of their families back home. To tell you a little bit about Freddie, Freddie is uh, a disciple since 1988. We got baptized around the same time. He was invited in his college by Jim Blau, who used to lead the church. He's, uh, since then, he's, he's an integral part of the Indian ministry. Uh, he's married to Renu, Renu Miranda. In fact, Renu became a disciple in my ministry. And uh, I was their best man in their wedding uh, many, many, many summers ago. And uh, they have two children, Simran and Manit. Both of them are uh, now in the universities. We, interestingly, Freddie and me, 
uh, got into the full-time ministry around the same time. In fact, the same day, uh, back in 1991, we were interviewed at the same time, interestingly. And uh, the reason was that we were inseparable twins. We were, I know all of us had somebody like that growing up spiritually, uh, learning God, the gospel memory, scriptures together, late nights, eating dinners at one o'clock in the morning, getting up at six in the morning, going on bike rides together. Uh, that's my memory. I have so many memories with Freddie. And uh, today it's a joy to see him do well in life. He is actually vice president uh, or even operational risk manager, I think, with, risk, with Citibank in Hong Kong. But more importantly, he's an incredible man of God. He is a passionate speaker, very humorous, by the way always brimming with ideas if you if you spend some time with him you will go away with with energy in your in your bones and so today it's my joy to present to us uh freddie miranda let's open our hearts to him amen I am my beloved's and he is mine, his banner over me is love. I am my beloved's and he is mine, his banner over me is love. I am my beloved's and he is mine, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. He lifted me to heavenly places his banner over me is love he lifted me up to heavenly places his banner over me is love he lifted me up to heavenly places his banner over me is love his banner over me is love Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Is the vine and we are the branches his banner over me is love he is the vine and we are the branches his banner over me is love he is the vine and we are the branches his banner over me is love his banner over me is love his banner Amen. Wow. Thank you, Jacob. And good morning, Dubai. Can you hear me? All right. Okay, cool. So let me share my screen. I'll dive straight into the message. Um, I'm going to start off. Yeah. Never shared a screen on Zoom before, but okay. Um. I hope you guys can see the screen. It's the title of my message for today. It's called Celebrating God's Grace. And uh, I just want to pay back to Jacob uh, just with the friendship we've had over the years. I remember a time when we were sharing a room and our house got robbed right around Christmas time. Actually, the thief walked over a sleeping brother and stole things right near our heads literally when we were sleeping we spent the whole of the other day the next day searching for it all over town went to the police station 
and we found Jacob's certificates, which was stolen right on our neighbor's ledge. And they were thinking we were playing a prank on them because we were single brothers and having lots of visitors and they didn't know what we were doing in that house. So, <laughs> you know, great memories, Jacob. I think this is one of those that I remember from those young days. <laughs> yes, awesome. So anyway, back to the message. Good morning, Dubai. And uh, I'm going to be talking about celebrating God's grace. Where we are in China, in Hong Kong, we are actually celebrating the Chinese New Year. So the greetings we usually wish people with, if you're uh, generally moving around, are two. Actually, you say, suddenly fly low, which is Happy New Year. But if you want somebody to give you a gift, then you will say, Kunge Fak Choi, which actually means, may you be very prosperous and have lots of wealth. And really what you're looking for is the person to produce a red packet envelope and they'll put some money in this and give it to you, right? And this is called a lie So literally everybody doesn't use Sunli Philo. Nobody wishes a happy new year. Everybody says, Kung uh, Fat Choi or Gong Shi Fat Choi, really looking for <laughs> the red envelope. But four days of celebration, everything is closed, shops are shut. Everybody is out visiting families. And of course, the pandemic has curtailed that. We cannot move around in groups of more than twos. Uh, so it's kind of a subdued celebration, but it's celebration nonetheless. So what do we celebrate in life? We celebrate special occasions, victories, success. Well, we talked about uh, in the communion, right? Uh, we talked about being away from God, salvation. When we get baptized, hey, it's time to celebrate. We celebrate salvation. But there's something I want to talk about today, and that is God's grace. It's not just a one-time thing. It's something that we face every day of our life. To celebrate God's mercy, we must understand it. It brings us into the light. The Bible says we were dead, now we're alive. It also on a daily basis basis provides an opportunity for transformation. It helps to change our lives. And the best part is it allows us to receive and show mercy and grace to others. Now, this is a wonderful thing about God's grace. Let's read in Ephesians 2, chapter 1 to 5. I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. You can follow along in your Bibles. I don't have an NIV version here, and I'll tell you why after I've read the scripture. It says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways in this present world. You were following the ruler of the domain of the air and the spirit now at work in the people who disobey. Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of our sinful flesh as we carried out the desires of the sinful flesh and its thoughts. Like all the others, you were by nature objects of God's wrath. But because he is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in sin or trespasses, it is by grace you have been saved. That's an awesome scripture. I really like the scripture. It tells us that if we lived sinful, wicked lives, we can still receive God's mercy. But most interestingly, it talks about something called object of God's wrath. Now, this is the only version that I saw where they actually talk about objects of God's wrath. There's the other versions have it slightly differently, right? But I like this because it talks about really what God's wrath is. And to understand this, we need to understand, I'll give you an analogy. We all have pets, right? We love pets. I mean, not all of us have pets. Some of us have pets. But in Hong Kong, uh, we are not allowed to have pets in the houses. So what people do is they have this really cute dogs that are actually the size of mugs. They're called teapot, teacup 
Pomerians, right? They're literally small, cute dogs, very tiny, because houses are small and people are so affectionate and they're so cute. Pets are an object of affection, right? But have you ever seen anybody having a pet, which is a cockroach? No. A cockroach cannot be an object of love. A cockroach is an object of hate. It is an object of wrath. I mean, you imagine you get up in the morning and you switch on the light in your kitchen and you see a cockroach. What is your instinct? You want to smack it. You want to kill it. You don't want that thing to live. It's an object of wrath. The Bible teaches us that we are actually object of God's wrath, spiritual cockroaches. That's what we are. And if you take away God's mercy, then what you have is God's wrath. But because God is merciful, he doesn't show us that wrath that we would show towards that cockroach. Okay, we go from dead due to transgressions to alive in sin because of God's wrath. But, you know, um, we have a choice every day that we should realize. We can choose to live under God's grace and celebrate living under God's race. Or we can follow our desires and distractions in life and live under guilt. I'll give an analogy of how in a simplistic way that happens to us. In my phone, I actually have two alarm clocks that I switch on every day, okay? I have a six o'clock alarm and I have a seven o'clock alarm. And usually I strive to get up at 6 a.m. in the morning. Okay, that is my intent. I want to get up at 6 a.m. But usually what happens is I hit the cancel button almost every time that 6 a.m. alarm rings. No, not the snooze. I hit the cancel knowing that I will have a second chance at 7 a.m. to wake up unless I have to have to get up at 6. I usually end up getting up at 7. Why? Because I want to enjoy that comfort of an extra hour's sleep. The thing is, by losing out on an hour, of maybe being more productive in the day, right? So I make a choice right there. And the choice is I have the desire to rest some more. And my personal convenience, I lose out on being productive and doing something good. Maybe for me, maybe for my family, it's one hour I've lost. In a spiritual way, we could be doing the same thing in our lives, right? We could be losing out on God's mercy because of choosing personal conveniences. And we all know people who do that. People who choose the wrong thing. They choose to not go with life. They choose to follow what we call a spiritual death. I want us to look at a biblical character that chose death over light, darkness over light, death over life. And we will hate to be compared to this person. But let's look at him. Let's read in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now, this is, I believe, an NIV version. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served where Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Let's stop here. This is six days before the Passover. That's like six days before Jesus is going to die. And this is after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, right? And the family, they are celebrating. They're here. Their best friends are here. It's a celebration. And what we see is Mary, Martha as usual, serving, 
Okay. And Mary takes a pint of pure nard, which I believe is a very expensive perfume. I looked up Amazon and I think it's like in the 200 US dollar range for a bottle of nard. Maybe I looked at the wrong product, but it looked expensive. If it's expensive today, it was expensive in those days too. Expensive perfume. She wanted to make Jesus feel special. The house is filled with the fragrance of perfume. And there's celebration. The family celebrating. But let's read on. Verses four to six. But one of his disciples, Jesus Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say it because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. What a difference, right? They want to celebrate and somebody comes up and loudly says something that really spoils the celebration. He couldn't see grace. Judas couldn't see God's grace. He saw no reason to celebrate. He tries to make the work done by another disciple of Jesus as unjust and unnecessary. Why do you need to do this? It's unjust. There are poor and you're wasting money. He doesn't see sacrifice and love. She had possibly saved up money. It's a year's wages, which is a lot of money. Imagine your entire annual salary going into one bottle of perfume. That's a lot of money. Okay. So you have to literally sacrifice to be able to pour it on somebody's feet and it goes waste. That's one year's salary going down the drain, literally. Okay. So there is sacrifice in there and there's love. You've got to love somebody to be able to do that. Right. He doesn't see that. He sees neglect. He sees waste. And the Bible tells us that his motive was actually to steal money. I don't know what he did with the money, but he used to put his hand into the bag and take money out. So I started thinking, if he was a thief, why was he a treasurer? Why did they put him in charge of the money knowing that he's actually stealing money? Maybe that was his strength. Maybe he was a good accountant. Maybe he was managing money pretty well and putting his hand into the money. I don't know. Maybe he started very small with taking a little bit in over time because he could manage to run the show well, so to speak. He got conceited. So he started small, left unrepentant, and it kept growing. Right? What are the sins we see of Judas here? We see greed, we see theft, we see criticism, we see deceit. Generally, if you're stealing something, it follows that you're not only stealing, you're also deceiving, right? We see self-righteousness. He's trying to show that he is, you know, his thoughts are the right thoughts. But underlying all of that is an ulterior motive. Conceited. These are the sins I could pull out. Maybe you can pull out more. But we know that Judas, there's always something negative uh, <laughs> associated with Judas in the Bible, right? But these are sins we struggle with too as disciples. Greed, theft, criticism, deceit, self-righteousness, conceit. And Judas was given so many opportunities to see grace. But you know what? He never saw it. He never saw grace. So when disciples were celebrating, he found no reason to celebrate. And he continues that downward spiral, as we will see on. When you sin, you will fail to see grace. You will fail to see grace and therefore fail to be joyful and celebrate. Your sin will stop you from seeing grace. Let's look at Matthew 27, verses 1 to 5. Early in the morning, 
all the chief priests and all the elders of the people made their plans to have Jesus executed. So this is after Jesus is arrested, right? So they bound him, led him away and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Judas always, no matter what we think, had an opportunity to feel remorse. He felt remorse towards the end. He didn't feel remorse when he saw that Mary was doing something good for Jesus. It is here that we see the first time Judas actually feeling remorse, but I believe it was too late. I call these red flags. You know, there's this guilt that makes us think we are doing something wrong. Red flags. At what point should that red flag or alarm have been going into Judas's head? This is wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. What I'm saying is wrong. What I'm thinking is wrong. If you look at the sequence, should that red flag have been flagged out there when the Jews came looking for Jesus and negotiating with him for 30 pieces of silver? 30 pieces of silver wasn't much. Right? He had a tragic end to his life. Now, here's the thing. Did Judas always dream of betraying Jesus? I don't think so. I think he started off as a nice guy. He was an ordinary guy that Jesus picked off the streets. And they were all people whom Jesus picked up. And they were simple people, you know, in some with better professions than the others. But generally, Jesus picked up people who had a good outlay in life. And then maybe he took missteps in those three years being with Jesus that led him there. Nobody thinks of ending up in the wrong place in life when they start off. So imagine a class, six-year-olds, okay? Teacher goes, okay, so class, what do you guys want to do when you grow up? And then Timmy puts his hand up and says, miss, I want to be a doctor. And Sonny says, Miss, I want to be an actor. And Johnny goes, Miss, I want to be a bank robber. Never happens. I mean, the whole class is going to gang up on him and beat him up. <laughs> Nobody wants to be a bank robber. Nobody wants to be a terrorist. Our greatest mistakes are not strategic plans. It is the small things we do. It's the small wrong decisions we make that end up with us going into the wrong place. You did not dream of it when you were growing up. We can let situations escalate without watching out, make poor choices. And that's, I believe, what Judas did. He had ample opportunity to see grace. He lived with Jesus for three years. There was ample display of mercy. Look at the miracles. Jesus calmed the sea, helped the sick, cured the lepers. He fed thousands, right? So if you were there, you would go from, whoa, thousands of people hungry to, wow, everybody's fed, right? Whoa, these lepers, 10 lepers want Jesus to heal them. How do we heal them? To, wow, all of them healed. Those red flags never went out in his life. Now let's look at another person. Paul, introducing Paul. Who was Paul? Paul was a persecutor. He was an accessory to Christian murder. How do we know that? When Stephen was stoned, the, the followers of Paul left their clothes at his feet, meaning he was the one who approved this. He was the one who actually sanctioned this, right? So today, if the police had to arrest everybody who murdered Stephen, Paul would have been at least accused of second or third degree murder because he was right there, right? He was leader of an extreme right wing movement that made people commit terrible acts. Of course, he killed Stephen and then he wanted to go to Damascus and prosecute 
the Christians over there and do more damage to the church. And as he's going there, we see Jesus entering his life. Let's read the scripture where Paul is talking about his encounter with Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 to 10. It says, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God and by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace to me has not been without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul's chance encounter with Jesus was so brief, so short, okay? Yet it completely turned his attitude towards spiritual life. It just completely changed him from being somebody who persecuted the Christians to actually becoming a Christian. Right? And he talks about grace out here. The grace of God has made me what I am. Okay, so let's look at the two characters we talked about. Paul versus Judas. Paul lived a religious life. Judas, we really do not know what his background was. But knowing the disciples that Jesus picked up, maybe an ordinary bloke on the street. Okay? Like one of us. Paul actually never met Jesus. He never met Jesus. He saw Jesus briefly in a vision. Never met him. And Jesus lived with Jesus. Literally. Lived. He was there when things happened. When Jesus challenged Paul, he met that challenge with humility. How do we know? He spent time fasting and praying. Those are humble acts to do. If somebody challenges you and you want to know what to do next, fast and pray. Judas, every time, met his challenge with stubbornness. So at the dinner table when Jesus said, you know, go and do what you're supposed to do, he was stubborn. He said, yes, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do it. The red flag did not go off at that time. He ended up following, Paul ended up following Jesus and preaching the gospel around the world. Judas ended up betraying Jesus. Paul was beheaded for his faith. Judas committed suicide out of guilt and remorse. So with Paul, we see the mercy and the grace of Christ had a profound effect on him. And not only that, on all of us, because really... Paul's preaching is what went into the world and helped so many Gentiles, as we heard in the communion, become disciples and we becoming disciples as well as an extension of that. And with Judas, whatever he saw with Jesus, it made no effect on him. Who do we identify with as Christians? Right? Very important. Here's Paul writing in one of his last letters. Here's a trustworthy saving that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. For that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example of those who believe in him and receive eternal life. It's an amazing scripture, actually, because... Uh, Paul, who is one of the greatest apostles, because of the way he preached around the world, calls himself the worst of sinners. Who is the worst of sinners? I can think of maybe people like Hitler, you know, really evil people, people like the gang lords in Africa who go about hacking and killing women and children. They're the worst of sinners. They do the worst of crimes. And Paul says, I am the worst of those sinners too. He calls himself lower than those sinners. We never can think of ourselves in those terms, brothers and sisters. But Paul saw grace and said, I am not worthy of grace. But, you know, he would celebrate it because we know that he talks about rejoicing. Right? 
He says, rejoice, and I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoicing in the dungeons? That's what Paul was. He was in the dungeons when he wrote that scripture. So how can he celebrate when he's going through such difficult times? Because he appreciates grace. He appreciates the chance God has given him to change his life. Um, I actually want to share about a brother. He is a Filipino brother. He is 50 years old. His name is Jeffrey. And um, Jeffrey became a disciple in 2002. Now, Jeffrey has had a very interesting story because Jeffrey uh, is from Hong Kong. His family, he was born and brought up in Hong Kong, but he's a, he's a Filipino, so he knows, he knows Tagalog, he knows uh, Cantonese, and he knows English. And uh, he spent a few years in Thailand, so he knows Thai as well. So Jeffrey's had a very difficult life. So he he was married and then he became a disciple, but his wife was not faithful to him. So he tried to uh, kind of reconcile his marriage, but uh, it didn't work out. So he got bitter and then he left God. His wife did come to church. She also became a disciple, but it didn't work out. And then uh, because she was unfaithful, they divorced and then... Uh, he left God. So around 2002 is when he got baptized and 2005 is when Jeffrey um, decided to leave the church. And then he went and he just lived his life the way he wanted to live his life. You know, in Hong Kong, you can have fun, unlimited fun if you really want to have fun. I mean, I'm talking about you can live freely, do whatever you want, right? That's why a lot of expats like to live here because there's absolutely nobody's going to question you if you do anything that you want. It's called the expat city. <laughs> okay. As long as you have money, you can do whatever you want. There are absolutely no uh, restrictions on what you can do. And so that's what he did. He went out having parties, uh, enjoying life, mingled with a lot of expats. And then in 2012, he went to Thailand and started working. He's working in the hotel industry, started working there, and then got into a relationship with a, um, a Thai Chinese local girl who had a son from a previous marriage and then moved in with her, with her family. And then the pandemic hit. And then in 2019, he lost his job and he was out of job without a job for a year. And then what happened is this... Uh, a uh, girlfriend of his went through a year of depression too at the same time. So that's when Jeffrey woke up and that red flag ticked into his head and he thought, I need to go to God. So he started attending church at the beginning of 2020 uh, and, uh, you know, kind of slowly started getting closer to God and started praying and started studying the Bible then he took a decision that he needs to do something that's right. And so he was challenged that you need to break off this relationship. And uh, if you really want uh, to save this girl, then you need to let her study the Bible on her own, break off this relationship. So he decided to relocate back to Hong Kong from Bangkok and um, come back and continue studying the Bible. This man is pure joy. I mean, he is so energetic. We get challenged in our group because we are so low key compared to Jeffrey. Connecting into the ministry, Jeffrey is like, what are we doing today? Here's the scripture I've shared today. You know, uh, can I pray with somebody today? He'll give a call into the group so that the phone rings at 8.30 every morning and whoever wants to join in is Jeffrey who wants to pray with them every day. You can see gratefulness. You, he wants to celebrate his, uh, his newfound faith. He's like aggressive. I have a holiday today. Who can come and meet me? So there are brothers who are now, who've been kind of relaxing in life as Christians. Now we're feeling challenged, right? I mean, I should not feel like going out and evangelizing. Jeffrey wants to go out and evangelize. He wants to do that every holiday. Whoa. It's like, okay, I need to catch up 
with somebody who is so energetic. He made the right choice of wanting to do the right thing. He has found God's grace and he wants to celebrate and give it. Every Sunday, we have two to three people who are attending as visitors because of Jeffrey. He said, I want to meet, I want to reach out to everybody who was in the church. There was a, like a whole Bible talk of Filipino families that left the church in 2003. He's like reaching out to them. He's going out cycling with somebody. He's going out hiking with somebody. He's doing things. He's just connecting with people. He got an Australian guy who's just roaming around in Hong Kong, you know, just aimbling in life. He said, you attend the church. This will change your life. He's bringing people to God. He is celebrating his Christian faith because he saw what life was outside the church and he didn't have God's mercy then. And here he's saying, wow, this is the right place for me. And he was challenged to what we call as decoupling, kind of, you know, move away from that relationship. He's made that decision, uh, let his girlfriend study the Bible in Thailand. And if things work out, then she can become a Christian and then they'll see how to work out the relationship. But Jeffrey was restored this month because we saw so much energy, so much of faith. Brothers and sisters, the worst of sinners can celebrate God's mercy. When you are forgiven, the burden of sin is lifted up and you can feel free to celebrate. You know, when you are burdened, you can't celebrate. And when you continue to sin, you'll continue to be burdened. So you can't celebrate. Poor choices lead to poor outcomes. Make the right choice. Stay in God's grace every day. And then you will celebrate. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Brother Freddy, for that uh, wonderful, awesome message. Uh, God bless. Thank you for bringing us back in this, you know, humble state of understanding our need of God's grace. Uh, moreover, thank you for uh, the great encouragement of reminding us uh, on the victory of ha having to receive that grace from, from God. Um, there's actually a prayer that I, I pray ev uh, every communion before I take the bread and wine. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. It, it goes like, uh, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And it, it always hits me. This always brings me in humility that I will always need Jesus' uh, blood you know, to cleanse me every day. I will always need God's grace and mercy. How many times I've betrayed Jesus, more times than Judas. How many times I've uh, denied uh, God, you know, mo even more times than Peter. And this is due to, you know, as you mentioned, neglecting those small red flags when it comes to choosing the right things. However, this also, it also brings me confidence, you know, of God's unconditional love. The message, it really brings, you know, it allows me to celebrate His glory and share his, even share His great love uh, to others. So thank you again, Brother Freddy, for that uh, wonderful message and God bless. Um, so for our announcement, uh, next Friday, uh, February 19th, is a podcast service. Uh, the church will continue our midweek together on February 16th to learn the Guard the Gospel uh, series session three from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, the leaders will not be meeting today at 3 p.m. Instead, there is leadership workshop, okay? Moving with the cloud for all the leaders, mighty warriors on February 19th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Also, kids' kingdoms and teens will have their meeting this afternoon. Parents kindly take time to thank the kids' kingdom workers. This year, we will collect our special contribution in October 1st week. We aim to help Yemen, Sudan, and adopt Sri Lanka School of Hope for the underprivileged kids. 
please plan to set aside an amount equal to our monthly contribution for the special contribution. And as again, always please set aside the monthly contribution and if possible, hand it in to your Bible talk leaders or finance. Uphold each other in prayer, especially those affected by COVID and stay indoors and keep safe. Before we end uh, in prayer, we close in prayer, we have one more announcement regarding the upcoming Women's Day to be given by my sister, Heidi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sisters. I hope you're all in, uh, excited to attend our uh, virtual Women's Day on March 12. Um, the registration is on, so start inviting your um, you know, family and friends. And um, give the full name of, the, uh, of your invites to your Bible Talk leaders. Um, I hope you're all aware by now that our 30-day uh, devotional series has started. We are actually now on our day three, and um, we have a convicting message actually from Denise Mora. So it's really exciting to continue this 30-day uh, women's devotional. And uh, if you haven't received your copy, uh, you may approach your uh, Bible talk leaders. And um, same goes, we started with our 30-day prayer and fasting. And uh, I do hope you're um, excited as I am to see how God will move all the women um, who will attend this um, event as we all are united in prayer and fasting. And um, in case there are still uh, other women or sisters who wants to commit to uh, prayer and fasting, you, may, uh, you are free to do so, okay? And um, lastly, let's continue to uphold each other and pray that you know, God will bless the event and will help us reach so many souls um, for uh, looking for uh, our God. That's all, back to you, Darwin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to God in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing me. Thank you for loving me, Heavenly Father. Thank you for letting me receive your gift, your gift of eternal life, Heavenly Father. Lord, thank you for revealing your unconditional love to us through your word. Thank you for making it possible for us to share this love. As we go about the rest of the day or the week, open our eyes that we may see wondrous things in your word that that the speaker has shared. Let uh, those who come here with broken hearts leave this meeting revived and restored, Heavenly Father. Help us to continue living and walking according to your word and not by what we see. Father, help us to turn our eyes away from the worthless things so that we can focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We pray this, trusting and believing in you. Amen. and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are all I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and of the Master. I live for each day. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes His home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since He promised me that we never would part. Jesus is well and alive.